Okay, so feel free to jump in with questions. Or, um, so now I'm going to talk about the next part of your assignment, um, which is uh, really your primary paper assignment for the entire semester. Um, and you will do some other things, but um, most of you are first year students. I don't know that you will get to the point of having good enough research to write a meaningful research paper. You're still going to have a shell of a research paper. And you might talk more about what you're going to do than what you've done. But I want the survey paper to be a real survey paper. Um, we had two of the students from last year's class publish the survey papers already, although they're submitting it very slightly. So if done right, this assignment can be one of your publishers. Um, so your assignment is a survey paper of at least eight to 10 pages. Um, and whether or not it's eight to 10, uh, so it's at least eight pages of text, 10 pages if you count references, because you're going to have at least 50 references. Now, realistically, both rules were published last semester were more like 15 page survey papers with 100 references because they were very thorough. It's probably what they did in, uh, in good, good shape, but um, you'd be surprised how quickly you can get to 100 references. Um, survey paper. Survey paper. Survey paper. Yeah, survey paper. Um, uh, and, and a number of the other people really had no intention of publishing the survey paper. Uh, even if you don't plan on publishing this, your thesis will have a section called related work. Um, every paper you write will probably have related work. So this is also about setting the background for that and being able to use it for that. Um, so you're going to turn in your first draft, a full draft, in four weeks. You'll actually have some stepping stones along the way. Um, and then your final paper is due in about 60. So it's a little more than halfway, about halfway through the semester. We'll have a bunch of other assignments as well. Um, we will probably give you some feedback. So this four to six weeks, I may actually increase that. The size of the class is smaller, so I thought I could pull it back. I have to read you all of the papers and give you feedback, so it may go seven weeks before the final. The final, your final draft will be due a week after I can read and give you new comments. My current estimate is six weeks. Out. Okay. In addition, um, everyone will be giving feedback on at least three other papers at some point. So you're also going to do peer reviews. We'll talk about peer reviews and stuff when we get to that point. Um, but you'll all be giving. So you're going to get feedback from multiple people. I know some of you will be like, "That's not my area." That's okay. Who do you think a survey paper is intended for? Not the people in the area, right? If you're an expert in whatever, you probably aren't reading the survey paper about that. Survey papers are people who are trying to get in, introduced to the area. So it's in fact good that your survey papers are read by people who are not actually in the area. Okay, so step one, which is really to get the lay of the land. So for next week, I want you to search for survey papers in the area you're thinking of doing a survey paper. Um, you're going to critically read, like we did last week, at least three of those survey papers, and you're going to build a topic map, map which I'll talk about in just a little bit, to sort of figure out where there's a gap. You don't write a, want, want to write a survey paper where last year somebody published a survey paper on exactly the same thing. And all this will be online. Um, so this is sort of give you a feel. So as we're going through stuff today, if you're not sure what's going on, I'm going to actually ask you to, uh, for next week's uh, journal, to, to put some of your observations from your critical read of the, at least three survey papers. Um, I'm not going to ask for all of the notes. Some of you had good detailed critical reads where there was like two or three pages worth of notes. Others had like a couple paragraphs. Right? Your critical read for a survey paper probably should generate a couple, a page or two of notes or three. Um, but I'm fine with you just having uh, a couple paragraphs so I know you've actually done the read and you brought up the most important part. A critical read will often say, here's a bunch of things wrong with the paper. So when I read an eight-page paper and critically, I generally generally a two to three page analysis of that paper. Sometimes it's an eight-page analysis of an eight-page paper, but that's depends on where it's gonna go. Um, but don't worry too much about that. Although I'm just really checking that you you've dug in and you've got something from them. And we'll talk about what a topic map means in just a little bit. So but any question with this part of the assignment? So the first part is the lot tech piece, get playing and then this is actually the real work. Go find and read some survey papers. So, um, are you going to find survey papers? Google Scholar. Okay. So, what are you going to look for? You work with surveys, probably not a bad place to start, but anything else you might search for? Because I'll guarantee you, not all good surveys say the word survey in title. What else might you search for? Right, so there are actually publications like ACM surveys, IEEE communications, surveys, and support, but right? everything that shows up in there. 
is a survey or a tutorial, right? So you can look in those for just about anything, and it should be a survey or a tutorial. So Jennifer, on, your, on the other side, what do you think? I don't know if this is working. <laughs> I can't hear you really well on this computer. Okay. Well, it might also be that my because I'm like using the laptop as its microphone. So next class, I'll try bringing a headset so that makes it any better. So apologize. Um, so so I'll find the other one. Oh, okay. <laughs> It's finding the one that doesn't work. <laughs> um, so what else might we search for for if you're going to go and try and find a survey paper? Besides searching in survey publications like ACM surveys or searching for the word survey, what else might we look for? Uh, I've mostly just run across them in odd places like IEEE had an email the other day offering student prices on some classes. I wasn't really interested in the classes, but I looked at who was teaching the classes and then looked at what they'd been writing about. Yeah, so, so yeah, you can definitely, if you look for particular authors, look this authors, but how, how do you know the survey? Because it says it in the title. Oh, yeah, if it says survey, it's a, so I'm looking, there's two other keywords that may show up in the title besides survey that might tell you it's a survey paper. What else might show up? I don't remember Roger. Roger, Roger. So what do you think? So, so another common word, compilation? No, because no good survey paper is a compilation. But we'll talk about that. But, but that, I mean, that word might, might be there, but um, oh, co comparison may be a comparison. I thought you said compilation. Um, comparison maybe, um, but review or overview, right, are often, so in, in magazine articles, they often use the word overview of, right, or review of, right? Both of those are suggestion that it's a broader review. And in fact, in, in IEEE, sometimes they will push for a survey to be broader than a review. Right? A, viewer, a review might review only 10 or 20 papers. A survey might have 50 or 100. So there might be sort of scales going on. But, um, so how many of you have read a survey paper? Oh, survey papers in the back row. Okay. Um, so Heather, why did you read a survey paper? And what makes it what makes a good survey paper? Have you, have you ever read a good one? And that really is, we're going to be talking about that. So a good survey paper, right, um, and, and for those who are listening and not live online, right, stop, think of some characteristics and put those in your journal. So you think about what's going on in the video. Okay, so what is, a, a, when we're going to write a survey paper, right? So first, if we're going to write a good survey paper, we have to select a topic for a good, impactful survey. You really have to satisfy a couple of requirements. So first is the subfield is newly emerging. I can't write a good survey paper on 18th century physics. Okay, I could, but no one will care because it's been around for a long time. Hasn't it? So you've got to find some subfield generally that is newly emerging, something that you want to talk about. Now, because we have so many research papers coming out, there almost always is a whole lot of new stuff. So a different way of looking at that is you have to have a large enough collection of new stuff to talk about in your survey paper. Now, it doesn't mean it only talks about new stuff, but you have to have enough new stuff. Um, hopefully, if you want to have an impact, you want the popularity of the field to be something that will grow over time. If I choose something that is dwindling of interest, okay, um, how to deal with hollerith cards, right, punch cards, right? Not growing area, no one's going to care very soon. Right? Um, so you got to find something you think will be growing. Now, that's tricky, right, because you, that's your, your personal preference, whether or not it's going to grow. Um, a critical number of papers with new algorithms and approaches exist at least 20 to 40. If you can't get 20 to 40 
new papers that have not been in another survey, it's probably not time for another survey. Now, you might still have any papers, 50 papers, but only 40 of them are new because you're going to have to put them in context. You can do much older work as well. Hopefully, the authors are enthusiastic about the topic. Um, you can do a survey paper about stuff you don't care about. It just, just um, doesn't come out very good. Um, in, a survey paper does not exist. This is a list that, you know, this is something uh, a number of people say, right? If there's already a survey paper, don't do one. We'll come back to that in a second. Um, and you want to present a new and useful organization of the state. Okay, this is a little bit what Heaven is saying. Right? It's not an annotated bibliography. It is absolutely not paper one, paper two, paper three, and a short description of each one. A good survey paper is all about giving you a way of organizing the space of research in a way that helps the reader remember a larger number of papers, because they don't have to remember any papers, understand how the papers are connected, what's important and what's different right, in different ways, right? and maybe even see where there are gaps, and we'll come back to that. Right? So a number of people think that a survey paper doesn't exist as an important criteria, right? because if there's a survey paper. Um, I'll actually show you some data. Right? In various studies, the fact that a survey paper exists generally increases the survey's interest. As long as the survey paper and doesn't have the same organization. So that's not a criteria. So if we look at the impact of a, another survey paper, uh, and these are some particular papers, admittedly the data is a little bit old, but the last time I went to check this, it was still true. If I look at how many citations do you get of a survey paper that, for which there was never a survey before, you end up with something where there's no preceding surveys you might get between 20 and 30 citations. But one that had one survey paper before it, you often get in the range of 40 to 50, and one that has had two or more preceding survey papers, these are particular papers, but in general the same terms, you often end up getting hundreds. So why do you think an area that already has survey papers gets more citations to its survey paper? Go back to so this, if this is true, right, when the first person writes one, it, it's still true when the second person writes one, but if it feels growing, right, then there's a lot of new stuff. So there's a lot of new papers and a lot of new things that are emerging. So the bigger the field, the faster new papers come out, the more surveys you can write because another, you know, adversarial machine learning, right, there are 150 papers in the last two months, right, putting a good survey might actually be easy because they just keep coming out, right? Now, the first survey may get lots of citations, right? What it, you know, so sometimes a single survey paper, in fact, a good survey paper will often get you hundreds, unless it be in a next one. But, but because those other criteria dominate, right? if there's a survey paper, so it doesn't mean don't do a survey, but you cannot just do the same survey they did. That's never going to work, right? Now, a whole bunch of new papers came out. You can take some of the same ideas and expand on it, and now a whole bunch of new papers in the content. Right? Um, to be honest, part of the goal of the survey paper is to save people from reading 150 papers. They actually want to know what 12 to read out of 150, and you've done the hard work of condensing. Here are the key ideas that are fundamental. These ideas drive these extra papers. These are fine details. We'll get into that later. Um, now, the other part about survey papers is there are a lot of papers that are survey only, things like ACM surveys and transactions and surveys. Those do things that are survey only. Um, you'll find some papers, though, that have a combination of survey and research. In fact, lots of papers have a related work section, which is a kind of survey. It might be 25. I have an eight-page paper. I might have a page and a half on related work. That's almost a survey. Um, I can have a, a, a paper that spends half of its space talking about what everyone else did, why it didn't work, and how to put it in context, and then has my own research. Or I can actually have some that is a lot of survey, and a little bit new research. So what kind of new research might I do in a survey paper? Yeah. All right, so I, I got to identify a gap. Those actually tend to be more on this side because if I've identified a gap, I probably want to have a lot of time working on it. But there's a very common thing in survey papers that still end up getting lots of citations. That is a new kind of research. What might I do that no one else has done before? I can do a comparison, right? I might actually take five things that have never been compared and actually run them on the same data set, right? This paper ran on this data, this paper ran on this data, this paper. 
I do a survey and I unify it by saying, I'm going to run them all in the same exact data and give you a real set of comparisons. Now, how, how exciting from a research paper point of view is it that I compared five algorithms? Not enough to get into a serious publication. But if I add to that a good survey, I can now make the survey much stronger because I've actually not just said what the authors said, I've actually run new experiments, which sometimes I predict what the authors said or put it in a different context. It might have worked fine on this 10 item data set but when you try it on 100, it fails miserably. Or it works great on 100, so good on them, but you don't know. So giving the readers a step beyond stuff that's two or three years old by comparing it can actually be pretty useful. So, so, and then pure research papers can, of course, have this. But you'll notice on this plot, right, survey papers actually have a lot more. If I look back over my career, my largest papers, if you look at my top five or six papers, none of them are survey. Well, one of them might be considered a survey. Um, but most of them are not. On the other hand, if you look at my students' publications, um, the top five publications of my first 10 PhD students okay, all have survey papers, all of which have more than 1,000 citations from one paper, from their survey paper that I make them do. Not, so I'm not an author. But, um, a good survey paper that it takes a lot of time, but it can really help set up part of your career because if you get a paper, graduate paper with a thousand citations, well, at that time they probably they probably only had like four or five hundred. Even a paper with four or five hundred citations really makes a difference when you're out there. So um, take this assignment seriously. You can actually end up with something that's pretty good. Okay. So one of our goals um, for survey papers is really to come up with some criteria, a binary or n-ary criterion, um, that helps the reader understand the space. We want to take a bunch of papers and put them into a configuration that the readers can understand what's going on. So I like to think of it in, in two, uh, the, the simpler version, which you'll see in lots of survey papers, is pretty much a tree-like classification. I take some characteristic of my problem and I split the world based on that. And then based, now I, you know, I have my left category, my right category, and then I can say, okay, within that category, I divide it. Now, it's not, it's in fact almost never a balanced binary tree, but it's still kind of tree. And it helps people navigate. Oh, this is a system of type A with characteristic B. It shows up with you know, uh, subcategory I, and that allows me to say, here's a whole bunch of related stuff. Um, I've also done stuff in my papers um, where we actually come up with a couple of dimensions, and you'll actually see how this could be related to a tree in a second. But then I actually viewed it as like a 3D space. I put things in 3D space sort of giving you a feel for how things are related. So given a, you know, a three-dimensional space, I can make a three-level tree because I can say, well, take this first axis and we're going to divide them to things above this point and after, below this point. That gives me a, 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 a dimension. And then on that, I can divide each of the other branches. But there's lots of things for which there's not a clear division. So the tree doesn't make near as much sense as sort of saying, okay, like here are two groups, right? They're, they're related. They're a little bit out of this category. They're, this one's a little bit up compared to that one, but they're, they're not a nice simple binary thing. So if problems are not categorical, if I have pure categories, the tree makes sense. If I have continuous variables, I actually like to think of them as dimensions, where things vary along the dimension. And you can view them like I did here in 3D, or a more common approach is to actually have a couple of 2D maps. Here's two variables. Here's where people are on this map. Here's two variables. Here's people are that. And that's really, if I just project down here, I get one map. I can project over here. So I can describe my 3D cube as three projections. You get a three cube. But the whole point is to really people, help people understand where things show up in the data, you want to give them this feel for a sense of understanding. Now, I said that intentionally as a sense of understanding. You, they may or may not understand it. In fact, very often in a good survey paper, you sort of oversimplify things. You oversimplify them so that the reader gets a basic understanding. Don't get lost in the nuances of the differences, right? You might say these two papers are, these two systems are extremely similar. Now, you could also list a whole page of how they're different, but if you don't say they're similar, then the user gets nothing to grab onto and just sort of say, I have a basic understanding of a, a relationship. So um, the goal is to come up with this way of having them, and what's useful is to prepare a figure which includes some of the following. You want to have, these are the classification criteria. Based on this, I'm going to put things in some place. The actual classifications. Um, a really good one will have some sort of mnemonic, either technical or symbolic or both. Um, so to help people understand this one, for example, we use a color coding. 
as well as spatial relationships. So you can sort of say, okay, there's a blue axis and a green axis, and the more I mix blue, green and blue to people in computer vision, which is what this paper's from, right, they understand that green plus, plus blue gives me these sort of cyan colors. Um, and I get this sort of red and blue is actually, were purplish, I'm not sure why they're, they might, they might still be purplish, it's still purple on the right? So having something that gets people to understand what's going on, coming up with some mnemonics to help you understand the category. Right? Um, you want to come up with some number of selected examples per class, and, and eventually a full set of references for selected examples, and I'll go to, to another example in a second, but you'll actually notice up here in our drawing, um, we actually have literally like a name and a reference. This map lets the people looking at this instantly see, here's the, the name of the authors and year and, and publication that most of these are, so that people could look at this and say, oh yes, I know that paper, or I don't know that paper, but I'm going to sort of get it and sort of see, you sort of see some temporal patterns where, like, here's 08, uh, 00, 13, 14. So, like, this dimension, people were advancing. In this dimension, we have 08, 11, 13. So, there's, like, a dimensional temporal shift. You can sort of see as people are, are expanding their research dimension. Uh, so, in fact, this was intentional. Are there other papers that might not violate this? Was there a paper that might be back here in 2014? Maybe. But we didn't include that in our survey. Is we wanted to show the progress in each of these dimensions. Right? Not all the progress, but we showed a progression in each of them to help people understand what's going on. Uh, and that gives them sort of what I call a vector of relevant characteristics. These are things that matter as the field advances. And they get a feeling of now I understand what's going on and what I'm directing. Now, does it completely explain the field? No. The goal of a survey paper is not to explain everything. It's to take a collection and make a logical sense out of it for the reader. And if it does that, then the readers feel they learn. Um, so you can play with all kinds of classifications. Um, so like here we have internet search algorithms. We can look at multi uh, multinational databases, conceptual modeling, randomized search, targeted search. You can take a whole bunch of ways of breaking up data. And once I've classified things, if this was a research area, right, you can then sort of find papers here. And I will tell you that lots of survey papers do this. The majority of them in one sense do. I will also tell you, this is not how anyone writes a survey paper. Notice the, the title of this was not how do I write a survey paper. It's how do I develop a survey paper. Your goal is to get to some of these things. But unlikely that's where you start. Part of what you want to do is you want to come out and start looking through your space and figure out, here's a way I can organize it. And so if I've spent enough time doing search algorithms, I can come up with entire if I'm an expert in it versus your student, so you don't have the expertise to say, here's the best way of looking at it. You want to actually want to come up with a drawing to sort of map that stuff together and come up with, here's one way of looking at it. This drawing took my student and I four tries before we got one that worked well for us. To say, here's how we explain all this stuff. Because every time we kept trying it, it was just confusing. We couldn't come up with a good order. So we've read all these papers. In fact, we read a whole lot more. And then you select out the ones that let you tell a story in, in sort of your drawing of this. So there's a bunch of software called mind mapping software, and some of these are, are a little bit more general. Um, but mind mapping software is all about allowing you to, and I'll show you an example in a second of what these look like. Um, there's a whole bunch of these you can choose from. Um, the one I use probably most often is either um, Mindly or Draw.io. Draw.io, I probably use most often most of Draw.io. They got a good name. Everyone else is sort of stuck with it. Um, I mind map, I've played with it a couple times. All of these, so this is much more detailed than you want for this, but um, this one's free. Mindly was uh, free, so it's not using it a lot. Um, but the basic idea of a mind map software is to help you put together drawings like this. So this is living beings, and then we have animal, ma mammals, trees, flowers, right? Unless you, this is a graphical hierarchy. You want to come up with something. You'll also notice it does some coloring, whatever, because part of your goal for your survey is to have this organization. This is a tree, right? It's not a binary tree. It's, like it's an area where n varies the kind of thing, right? And with good software, I can actually sort of type in a bunch of things, and I, I can build connections. If you don't like them, you can try connecting them in this way. Um, so for, for your assignment, I want you to sort of come up with a, a, a map of your space and your problem. And you might try four or five of them before you find one where you find a gap. So one thing we do want to do when we write a survey is Help identify a gap. You can let people read this and say, here are some future directions people should look at because they're not being solved. 
that will get more people to read your papers in general because they'll see if those are the directions, that's the direction you're looking for. How many of you would like to read a paper that tells you, here's the direction to go for your thesis? You'd want to know that. Here's the direction where no one's working. It's a good direction. Um, but also, if you do this for this assignment, part of my goal is for you to think about, here are the survey papers. You're going to read three of these. And if you want to read four or five, you get a better three. Here are the three survey papers. Here's how I would put them in a space. They categorize the world this way. They categorize the world this way. Is there a different way of looking at that space? Is another way of drawing. So this was these. This dog is a mammal is a living being. Those are simple. Here's a relationship. Any relationship you can talk about has a uses uh, organized. You can come up with lots of ways of talking verbally about this is related to that. And then you just draw an arc for whatever that relationship is. You can use different colors representing different arcs. So there's a lot of things you can play with to sort of call this. Um, uh, you can use the software. You don't have to. You can do this all by pen and paper. And or take pictures of it with your phone. I'm fine with that. But I want you to start thinking about how to organize your field and your papers. Um, and start by taking those survey papers and analyzing how do they organize them. So you can sort of see which of those work. And if you took exactly the same paper and you came up with a different organization, you probably could still have a survey paper. But my guess is by the time you read a survey paper, it's also long. So if you can find a gap, which is, well, no one's done a survey paper on this in the last four years. And there's 90 you know, papers a year, so I get 300 papers to look for. You have enough room to do a survey paper in that space. Part of that is you sort of doing this. Any questions about that? Again, the, this is what I meant by the concept drawing and map or whatever. Not particularly, and, and there's dozens of them. Any of these would also be concept drawings, right? It's how are you going to organize your space? But also think about how other people organize them as you read this year. Okay, so when, when writing a serving paper, um, you can start with a bunch of things, but these are the, the things I like to think about. Um, as, so now we're talking about um, the things you should talk about for a paper. But I want to be very clear, because I did this last year, and then in, the, in a number of the survey papers, people ended up telling me each of these for each paper. I absolutely do not want a survey paper, if you're working in this, that says, here's paper one, here are the seven W's, or the seven ideas. Here's paper two, here's the seven ideas. Right? This is not a list of properties of papers. But these are the things that you probably want to get some of these things for a particular example. Um, so the seven uh, W's, right? Who, what, when, where, why, how, and whom. Um, so whom is like, who, who's this for? Um, the essence, sorry. It can be very difficult to give this in one sentence. But if you're going to read through a bunch of papers, if you're doing your scan, right? So, if you're doing a survey paper, my expectation is you're going to have uh, 50 papers in the bibliography. You have read at least six of them carefully. You've probably scanned the others. And there might be somewhere in between a scan and a light read. So scan is it's only five or ten minutes. You probably went a little deeper than that, but you didn't spend two or three hours on it in your survey paper. It depends on where you want to go. So you can go through a larger number of the papers browsing through them or scanning through them. You want to make sure you answer it. So um, this may be hard to give in one or two senses, but what is some of the structure of a system or whatever you're going to look at? Um, some level of relevant details. Um, and an example right, that, that takes out some of the figures in the paper, using pseudocodes, some idea of how you're talking about what the sample is, the pros and cons, and the author's opinion of, of its potential. So, so if you're reading through survey papers, this is a little bit different than the six C's I have for your scan before. Now you're going a little bit deeper, but this is the minimum, right? Now, this is how I recommend you take notes while you're working with a survey paper. It is not how you write the survey paper. After you've done this, um, this sort of template structure is going to be connected in a different way. You're often going to choose one exemplar, right? And maybe the example that is here, this is the exemplar for all. And then I'm going to organize all the other papers that are related to it, maybe by looking at some of the items through in one through five and sort of say, okay, here's the things that let me classify. These five papers all go with this one exemplar. The exemplar becomes a class of papers. We should talk about shared attributes. And my expectation is the exemplar is the one that's related to these papers. And the others are the ones you sort of put around it. You sort of say, these are related. Now, the same paper can end up in two or three things. While we wrote, uh, well, I drew this as a hierarchy right here, right? 
one of the things I like about this is right, the same paper can have multiple dimensions in it. So if I try to do this hierarchy of splitting and, a prop, and I split it here, this left split could be moving on red axis for two different things. So the paper that's out here right, might have some combination of two variables and it becomes a little more complicated. So don't view it as a paper as you go through this process it ends up exactly one place in the paper. If it has characteristics of system A, it might show up in the first part and characteristics of system B, it might show up in the second part. Right? So, um, so actually I'll just use living animals, right? So if I talked about mammals, right? Mammals have a formal definition. But if I actually talked about things that have bills, right? Just those thought of us, right? With this weird mammal that has a bill, right? So depends on how to organize things. If I did it on, you know, phylogeny of animals and species, then I would have one organization. But if I look, the ductile platypus looks way more like a duck than it does like a dog. So I could have done things by how they visually appear. Over here, as it really, over here, it really has a bill and it looks like a duck. And over here, it lays eggs, right? It's all weird and scary. So it's a very weird animal to show up in multiple places. So the same will show up in your survey papers. You can have papers that show up in more than one place. But as you're reading through them, as you're scan, you want to capture more information than just the, the things we had before. Um, some relevant details, some of about its structure, how the system put together. Um, so if you're doing a, a survey for those, right, you're now going to take all those little pieces and you're going to weave them together in a story. And we'll talk a lot more about storytelling and writing in the next two weeks, but um, for now, remember that a good survey is not just a summary. You have to compare and contrast papers. You've got to tell a story with a theme and a goal, and we'll talk a little bit more about that uh, get to the writing stuff. Um, and it's really the goal is to help people organize their ideas. And oddly enough, part of my goal is for this to help you organize your ideas. Because if you're about to start in research, the survey paper becomes a way for you to figure out what has been done recently. And what will that let you decide? What's the advantage of you doing a survey before you do your research? No gap, right? Obviously, if you've done a good survey, you know who's done what recently. Maybe even can project a little bit where they're going. You can sort of say, now I see a gap. As you work on how to organize these ideas, you're actually trying to find a way to organize ideas so you can help identify that gap for yourself. And don't worry too much if in your survey paper you've identified that gap and you don't want to tell anyone else about it. By the time your good survey paper gets published, you should have an advantage over anybody else. And now when they start working on it, they're going to start citing your early publications, so it'll be good for you. Don't worry about hiding your, your, your idea of where to go. Um, it should not be complete. It need not be complete, but I would say it should not be complete. Um, but it should be strong and relatively complete with any story or theme. Right? There's no way I'm going to cover all the papers. But if I choose a particular theme, I need to make sure I get the most important papers through, my, through that subfield. Okay, so how do we talk about doing this? Now, the slides... Unfortunately, probably a little bit uh, small to read, um, but you're going to read about the general subjects to warm up. Pick a target journal and re read the located surveys. That's actually your assignment for next week is read. read some related surveys. Um, you're eventually going to de determine your proposed classification and select at least 40-day papers on various approaches from the literature based on your classification ideas. Um, explain why the proposed classification represents a contribution to science. So, guess what? That's going to be your next and you're going to be working on that. Um, so coming up with a classification. Now, I will tell you, it's hard to go with a classification until you've read enough papers. So you should start, if you have time, you might start scanning them. But if not, um, just the fact that you've read three or four survey papers will give you some ideas on how to organize related to what they did or to be different from what they did. It doesn't have to be you know all the papers. Once you come up with your idea, um, you're going to sort of, for each of those, go through those seven, those sort of, Scan through those papers, write the seven ideas mentioned earlier in this paper, um, sort of use this to put them where they belong in my classification. And as you do this, the 70, uh, 50 to 80 papers, right, you're going to start recognizing, oh, this paper does not fit my classification scheme. Okay? You need a new classification scheme or just put this paper on the side and they never use it. If you get a couple of outliers, just ignore them. If you get a whole bunch of outliers, time to reconsider your classification scheme and come up with a new way of looking at them. Because clearly you missed something 
if you can't put a bunch of papers in a meaningful place. Now, the other possibility is you put them all in your classification and they're all in like one lump and there's no separation. That's a different problem. You still need to then reconsider your classification scheme to find a way to separate them. Because it doesn't do a good survey to say, here's a bunch of papers, they're all related, and there's like no logical separation to help them understand what's going on. So you want to find a way to separate them. Um, part of the way of doing that is to pick the key points of comparisons among the papers. Um, Um, so, yes, lots of papers will have the sentiment. Some will have it graphically. So, and I would say, I had it graphically, I showed them graphically. Lots of papers don't do it graphically. I don't understand why, but you know, my view is graphically. But not everyone's graphical, they're, they're, they're textual. So, but every good survey paper has an organization. Right? Can I tell, is there a simple model for it? No. Why? Because every organization is relatively unique. Otherwise, that wouldn't be a good survey paper. If I just do the same organization as last year, that's not going to be novel. Like people aren't going to see something new. So part of what you're looking for is here's a way that makes sense to me. Right? So and if you if you can organize a bunch of papers and make sense of it, chances are that will help some other people. Now you might think not just how does it work for me, but how does it work for a broader group of people. You will actually talk about when you do your graphs and you have your here's your classification. You just share it with everyone else in the classroom. At that stage, it'll be the first time we share it and get feedback, right? If you can't explain your classification so that other people understand it, maybe it's not a good classification. And your insecurity rate, right? well, you know, most people in the room, people have a hard time. There's often a little space for Dan. I think I can do some Dan stuff like that. That's okay. But if you're able to explain that classification, so is there a model? Any good survey paper. If you find a survey paper that's got more than 100 citations, I will almost assure you it will have an organization in it. Just that everyone might be different. So that's why I can't point you to like, here's a model that they use. There are thousands of models, hundreds of models. Pick one that you like. Now, if you take one that you like, but it's not in your field, and you can really rip off the entire organizational structure if that would apply to your field. So the chances are it doesn't quite transmit across. Um, so, uh, so you pick the so as you're trying to figure out like if they're all lumped together or if they just don't work right. Um, one way of figuring out what some of that is going to be is to pick these key points of comparison among the papers, um, and then maybe try and find a way to, to say, well, can I use that? Right? Is this paper compared them on performance? Right? And this paper compared them on size, memory size use. And these compared them on um, code complexity. Right? Now I have dimensions. If research papers compared them against other people in some dimension, that's a possible dimension for you to use. Okay, so you come up with a list right now. You don't want 50 dimensions. That does not make, you know, if I have 50 papers and 50 dimensions, people don't get any savings mentally out of it. You have to reduce the number of dimensions. But you can then try and choose which ones will matter. Um, I would recommend try to take some of those key points of comparisons and generate some figures. Um, one of the blockchain structures or the pseudocode presentation, I'll come up with something, um, and choose the presentation form, which, which basically gives you the essence of that class the example belongs to. So if I'm going to put together five or ten papers, which is a sort of good grouping or survey paper, because I really don't have too many ideas. If I have ten ideas, each of the five papers, I get 50 papers. If I have three papers per idea, 50 papers, now I need to have like 20 ideas. It becomes too hard. If I can get eight papers, Let's say I do 10 papers, right? Now I'm down to five ideas. Here's five key groupings, and I get all 50 papers. I might actually have like 12, because the same paper can drop a couple, right? But you don't want more than what people can remember. So a Miller's rule, right? What can people remember? Seven plus or minus two, right? That's what, so in fact, seven plus or minus two is pushing it. I'd say you know, five plus or minus two is good for a paper in terms of the key organizational idea. Now, if you make it a hierarchy, you can get some more because the, the, the structure of the hierarchy can help you. Um, so if the generated classification, so once I come up with the idea of classifications and some examples, like right, now I can put them together and I can sort of go through my hierarchy and this is where some of the power of a good survey comes in. If I go through and I build my hierarchy and there's one or two classes that have almost nothing in it, now you've identified a gap. Right? Those are 
re new research avenues, right? And they define a research strategy for those who decide to take that out. Right? Now, oddly enough, if you don't want to tell anyone your idea, you do the same thing, and you say, here are the three gaps that I noticed that I'm not going to do. So I'm going to put those in the survey paper. I'm going to say the fourth gap to myself. Okay. As long as you identify some gaps in your survey paper, people will be excited. Um, and when you go to sort of play with those, um, I'm going go back to my drawing here, right? So sometimes like, you have to be a little careful, right? When we did this drawing, right, our paper, we were trying to differentiate. Well, this is actually more of a research paper with a little bit of survey in it. Um, we showed so that, like, we're off this, like, everyone else lives on one of these three spaces. We're completely different. We got there because we identified the gap of no one has done all three of these things. If we do all of these things, we will have a unique dimension to go, right? So that's where the sort of gap analysis really comes in and leads to where it goes. There are some survey before we got our, we got our paper public, but it's a while we have one. Um, so then you're going to, so from a research point of view, you're going to redefine your research strategy for those who decide to analyze the hybrid approaches, the two or three elements, right? So a hybrid approach can either be a, symbi a sim symbiosis, right, where the two things work together, or a competition um, where they sort of fight against each other, or a synergy where you combine the two solutions or combine the one. Right? So whenever I have two characteristics, they either complement each other, they really care, or they compete against each other, right? So you can think about yourself once you have these classifications. What happens if I combine these two ideas? What happens if I, these two ideas are not complementary, so they're not really competing? Or if I combine them, I can see something that's better than either one. That's really nice. Right? So those give you some level of discussion. And this is an important part of the survey paper. It is not a summary of papers. It's a survey. It looks at things, and then it makes discussion, comparing and contrasting about things right, that can lead to new avenues for, for better uh, ideas. Um, after you've done that, you sort of go back and you add the preamble and conclusion uh, in the final text. Um, Ideally, you're going to generate one pearl of wisdom that sheds light on the essence of the, the paper and increase the probability that we reference a lot. Right? If you can come up with one nice sentence or sentence or two that summarize the entire survey paper, right? other people who read the survey paper will more likely to cite those one or two sentences because you've drawn a conclusion. Why do they want to cite your paper? Because they want to draw that conclusion, but they don't have the time to justify it. By citing your paper, that has done this analysis and has all of this analysis, they can justify the conclusion they wanted to make in their paper by citing yours. So think about those conclusions. Sometimes people are a little reticent to draw a strong conclusion. My recommendation is a good survey paper will draw at least one, maybe two, strong conclusions that other people will want to build on. So as long as they're not contradictory, it's okay to have two. Um, so uh, these were my 10 steps to getting the survey paper done. So the next level is to ask people, ask peers to review your paper and edit, edit, edit. Uh, that might be going back up and editing lots of things. This is not necessarily linear. You go from eight, from nine back up to three and start over again. Uh, and then submit the paper to a journal. And that will give you a process to hopefully get a survey paper published. Any questions about the survey development process? I've actually talked about writing again. Notice nothing this week about how to write. This is all about how to organize, how to find, how to organize. Compare and contrast. Okay. Okay. This Okay, so I'm now going to jump to, and we'll have two lectures at least, and it's maybe two and a half at uh, And what do I think? So your primary job as a researcher is actually a professional one. Um, now, for some of you who want to read more, you're not getting enough, um, this is a book I highly recommend on, on how to write for science. It's called uh, Writing Science, a a How to Guide the Pub, all those cited in front of wrote by Joshua Shimon. It's not CS oriented at all. So Jennifer, you may like it. It's more natural science book. Um, it's really about how do I tell stories 
and it tries to use examples from lots of different sciences. And the fact that it's not in your field, I think, will actually make it easier for you to try and relate to what they're trying to tell. Because my guess is you will actually find reading this other stuff that you don't normally read so interesting, and you will feel you understand it. Um, you may or may not actually understand it, but that's not the goal. Right? The goal is to get people to have some level of understanding, but more importantly, to feel they have a good level of understanding. That if they feel they understand it, then they're more likely to care about the paper and try and build on it. Um, he also has this nice video, which I'm not going to go through, but um, if you'd rather watch than read, he gives a nice summary of a lot of his material. Um, some of my ideas in here are based uh, on, the, on that book, but there's also a whole bunch of other videos that are, that are different. So um, we're going to talk about the writing process first, how to get started, and what's a good process, and why process is not equal to writing, but process might in fact be more important. Because a good process will get you to the point where eventually you will have good writing. In the beginning, it may not. Um, so there's an author whose name is Gittimore. Uh, here's his 5.5 things to improve your writing. Um, and so first is just sit down and write something. Capture your thoughts and ideas the second they occur. Write it like you would say it, at least at first. Right? So lots of people, uh, science writing often has a sort of stifly third person uh, style of writing that lots of science uses, but that's not the way you think and write, like, at least not for most people. So if that's not the way you think or write, then don't write that way, at least not in the beginning. You can always clean it up and edit it to be that style later, but the first part of writing is about you telling the story, so get it out. Um, edit to make sure your thoughts are simple and easy to understand and to complete. Um, edit early, edit often. Uh, you're writing for the readers and for yourself. An important part of writing is about you understanding your own ideas. If you can't express them to other people, maybe you don't understand it well. Right? And I've literally been on uh, review panels for proposals where people are like, if this person can't explain what they're trying to do, I don't think they understand. Because if you really understood it, you can explain it to me. But if your, your writing is not understandable, then maybe you don't really understand it yourself. So even if you're not focusing about uh, trying to get it published in the beginning, right? As you try and write early in your PhD, you will have a better and better understanding of what it is you're doing. Not waiting until it's done and then I'll write that. That's not the way to do science. You should be writing it up before you do the experiment, at least part of it. So, <coughs> um, what's, the, uh, what, what's an effective writing process? So, how much time for writing a paper do you think is actually writing a paper? Let's do a poll. Jennifer? I'm going to lose you. Heather, what do you think? How much time do you spend writing a paper when you're writing a paper? Hmm? I'm talking about percentage, not the total length of time. Oh, time. Percentage. Um, oh, I, I'm not even counting the research. Okay. No, no, so no, we're talking all the time that is not doing the research. What time of writing is writing? Of course, that's a funny phrase. But <laughs> yeah. Anybody else want to answer? When, I, when I'm writing, I find myself getting you know, a lot of time. So, uh, a good process is that. So, I would, I would say what we call pre-writing, which is organizing your ideas, but not yet actually writing stuff, is probably around 25% of the time. Writing is around 25% of the time, and rewriting is 50% of the time. You spend most of your time rewriting your paper, not writing your paper. Um, so if you have a good process, timelines and tools, things like getting LaTeX or whatever, right, um, you can really help this process become strong. A lot of people are, so in fact, if you stare at the paper, have any of you ever suffered from writer's block? From a what's a writer? So um, we'll, we'll talk about this, right? Um, but for most people, but more so for researchers, um, is that the biggest mistake for the writer is to wait until it's ready, let alone waiting for it to be perfect. Um, the rewriting process begins when you show your first draft to other people and start getting feedback. Okay? Rewriting is when you get feedback and make it better. Now, 
You can have some own rewriting based on your own feedback, but that's okay. Um, Ray, Beethoven went through 70 drafts of Mozart's um, symphony. As uh, William Zissner, who's a famous writer, right? rewriting is where the game is won or lost. Rewriting is the essence of writing. It's not about how you get that first stuff out on paper. Um, uh, rewriting is the essence of writing well. It's where the game is won or lost. The idea is hard to accept for lots of people. Right? We have an emotional equity on our first drafts. We can't believe it wasn't born perfect. Uh, there are people, at least the latest, and not going to my drafts are always bad. Um, but the odds are close to 100% that it wasn't. Most writers don't initially say what they want to say. They don't say it as well. Somehow it sounded perfect in my head, and when it comes out on paper, it's not what I meant. You have to go through that. Um, newly hatched schemes are almost always something that's wrong with it. It's not clear. It's not logical. It's verbose. It's clunky. It's pretentious. It's boring. It's full of clutter, full of cliches, less rhythm. Right? The point is, clear writing is a result of a lot of thinking. So don't worry if when you sit down to write, you don't know what to say. Uh, it's okay. Um, there's actually this phrase common in the, in the literature called shitty first drafts. Um, uh, and it's also, I'm going to use this as why I don't recommend starting with an outline. Many of you may have learned in school, here is a structured way of writing. First you write an outline. And then you figure out to do it. Now, if I have to do a report for, for a company that has to have organized sections in it, then I might start with that outline. But that's to me not writing. That is filling out a report, not writing. Um, now, do, is my paper going to have sections? Yes. But I don't care about that, right? I, mean, I will get to having those later. I want to figure out what I want to write about. So, so is that what you're going to do in the Yes. Yes. Um, it is, but I don't recommend starting with that. Those things are going to be there. The hardest and most important part about writing is not filling out the sections. It's what is my story? What is it I'm trying to say? Right? And once I understand what I want to say, whether or not a piece of text ends up in the introduction or in the conclusion or in related work, I can decide that later. What I really want to say is what's the story I want to talk about? What are the ideas I have to get out? Um, so you should really just focus on bad first drafts, right? Getting stuff done and putting a bunch of ideas down on paper. And once you have that, you can rewrite it to make it into an outline. You can figure out these are the parts I'm going to do. Now, admittedly, you know there are things you're going to have to talk about. Um, but that's not where I want to start. I want to start with what's the most important things I want to talk about. So this is Knight's uh, stuff by Ann Lampoff, uh, Lampoff on City First Draft Papers and what's along. So we're now going to do a quick exercise in class. Um, and Jennifer, you please try this at home, and then we'll talk about it in a second. So for a lot of people, but especially if you get stuff with writer's block, right, I actually want to try and get you to do something very different. Because very often, the words get in the way. Literally, staring at a blank face of paper gets in your way. Um, seeing words slows down your thinking and often makes people want to edit. I'm sure Jennifer can't handle a squiggly red line and wants to edit it as soon as you know. That distracts you from writing. Right? It's about grammar, whatever. You can fix all that stuff up. But I want you to think about this. So I want you to, if you're, you're, if you're good enough with your laptop, you're on the laptop, you want to do a piece of paper, I want you to close your eyes, okay? Write, type in whatever your native language is. So don't worry about English if that's not your native language. But how you would do this in whatever your, whatever your mind thinks in. And I want you to think about your research. And I want you to write. Uh, you can feel free to jump between ideas because your mind might jump between things. Right? I'm going to take probably two or three minutes, and I'm going to give you a chance to do this with your eyes closed. No looking. Don't worry if your keyboard is like, like doing a weird thing. Don't look at it. Right? Just close your eyes and write. There's nothing up here. Just close your eyes, open up an editor of some kind, and start writing about your research. Or write on your paper.
Very long. Um, anybody have your, your reactions to this exercise? I know for many people this is really hard. Probably a, a very abundant support. Any of you like the idea of this? Any of you struggle with this as a part? How does it feel as you're trying to do this? Got better? Um, so did anyone find this actually may be a school more peaceful? So in the beginning, this is very hard. This is not but one of the reasons that I like to recommend this is that for many people, it is in fact physiologically, it is very hard not to have part of your brain dealing with what's coming into your eyes. Depending on how you measure it, between 40 and 60 percent of your brain is tied to what happens in your eyes. It's very hard to make it go away. So if there are words showing up in front of you and you are a textual type person, your eye is looking at them. And in fact, your your ability to write, your ability to type is so much slower than your ability to think. Your mind has time. It's like wandering around on the page and doing stuff, right? If you're even if you're looking sideways at the floor, right, your eyes are processing data which limits the rest of your thinking because it's stuck dealing with this visual input. Right? And some people can really just stare at stuff and not see it. Their brain, their brain can disengage. And most people struggle with it. So staring at it, literally staring at a blank page makes your writer's block worse because part of you is thinking there's nothing here. Right? And when you start writing it, you're not happy with it. the quality of it. When you close your eyes, you can set that part of it free. And don't worry if there's a gazillion typos. Um, now, it is problematic if you're off by one of the keyboard, <laughs> you get a little bit farther out, but I'll say, for a Russian like, well, it's no, like off by one of the keyboard doesn't really mean you have no idea what you wrote. So, um, so it's actually, it's, it's, for people who do this with pen and paper, which is where I'm using for years, it actually is harder, but if you always guarantee something right is, is like illegible, because you're off by one, there's nothing left to do. Actually, there's a, there's a set of macros and emacs that will fix this. Um, now, there's actually turned out to be a much better way. So this problem of having visual input, limiting your ability to think, what else might you do? Say it verbally, right? right. So we now all carry around these great little recording devices, right? So you can take your ideas and you can literally just record them, right? And then listen to them later. That's a good way of getting what the idea is. Um, even better, what else might I do? Such a screen. Do the dictation app. Somebody that actually takes speech to text. Mac users, it's built into the Macintosh operating system. Windows users, it's built into the Windows operating system, where you can get an app that will basically do your text. Now, have any of you used those dictation apps before? No? Okay. Highly recommend them. I will also tell you that most of them are not really good. They're probably between 75 and 80 percent accurate in what they get, and neither are around 50. I, I speak too fast. I have poor diction. I'm not sure what it is, but there's lots of mistakes in what's going on. It's like autocorrect on steroids. It just gets all kinds. Of, on the other hand, when I read it, I have no I, you know, I have no problem understanding what it is I say. Now there actually is dictation software, true dictation software, generally captures the audio and converts it to text. 
you can go back and listen to it yourself later. Okay? If you go for long periods with doing this, and the patients off of the cat to the audio is a little bit better. But it's important, again, part of the goal here is to do it while your mind is disengaged. The other thing that's nice about this is for some people, actually being engaged while disengaged is something that, that's good for them. So you can do this while you go for a walk. Right? Your eyes and brain are actually engaged, but they're engaged in other stuff which might let part of your brain be freed up to do the use. It's not looking at the writing that's important to you. You want to go for a walk and understand and see what's going on. And just keep putting all this stuff together. And don't worry that half the stuff is garbage. Because half of what you wrote is going to be garbage anyhow. You might write half of that stuff out of the way. Um, so now look back. And part of what you want to look for this, and we'll talk about sticky stories a little bit. But you want to look for storylines or snippets of stories in what you wrote. Um, is there something that is both novel, useful, and interesting? Now, most people, and I assume everyone in this room, think in words. Is anyone here that is not a verbal thinker? It's only like one in a hundred people that think not verbally. Um, so it's, it's much more common, right? Um, so verbal thinkers, right, while you're going through this process, did you have imagery in your head? Did you see things in your head as you were writing? You did. Anybody else? So if you don't, right, so that's okay. There's nothing right or wrong about it. Right? But if you can capture some of those, they can be really useful things. I'm um, going we'll to come back to those in just a second. But as you're going through this, you want to look for possible flows, connections of ideas. Something in your mind was connecting one idea to the next idea. And if you do this, you're often, even with what you're doing, right, your mind can still think much faster than you can type or write. And so it's racing ahead to other things. Even if you do it verbally, you can think much faster than you can talk. So your mind's connecting with things. So part of what you want to do is you want to go back and try and find flows, connections of ideas that were happening that you might have actually thought of but couldn't get out fast enough or things that were there, right? Um, you want to find these connections and these ways of thinking about it because you got to find a way to get people to remember your work. If you can't remember it as you're writing it, right, it's not a very memorable way of putting it together. So those pieces that work for you of, I had this idea and eventually it came back out, right? And then you look back at it and you can sort of see those connections. That can be very powerful for the things that will work. So the next one actually does require a piece of paper. Um, does everyone have paper? Can borrow paper? Um, so I guess you can do this without it, but I don't, but it's better with a piece of paper. Um, so I want you to go back and take one of the, take some of the ideas, and this is about this is what I call you need a pen too? I got a pen. <laughs> okay, so I want you to think about drawing one of your ideas. No words, no box diagram. I want you to think about drawing it as though you were explaining it to it's your, your inner child. But think about it is how would it, you could think in shapes, pictures, characters, people, whatever, as though you were explaining your research idea to a one, oh, sorry, to a first grader. So five, six year old, right? Six year old, right? Very simple language, very simple drawing. So we're going to take a minute or two and I want you to think about how to take one of your ideas and draw it in something that would be a cartoon, picture, figure, whatever is going on for a first grader. Now, I'm not going to make you close your eyes and draw. You can do it that way, but most people really struggle with that. <laughs> nope. No words. Jennifer, are you there trying these exercises? In my mind, I am. Okay.
exercise where you closed your eyes, okay, um, and try the same thing now, but instead of trying to just write the ideas and the words you did the first time, think about how you did your drawing, and how I would tell you, tell a story, so now you're basically ready to think your path to go with your drawing. Tell the story of your research idea to a first or a third grader, how you use words, but you have to do it with your drawing. And I will also let you use your eyes, you can have your eyes open. <laughs> um, but now tell us that story. I says, if we can let you do it, I'm going to put these together. <laughs>
academic writing book. So we will um, first, how does this writing you're trying to feel after you thought about the drawing feel like more connected, like you're telling a story? Because I don't tell stories. It still seems like it's it seems like writing book. So this is another way, especially if you're feeling writing block, right? This is an exercise, but it's also in my view. A good way to write a good paper, or a paper of any sort, is to think about it in comic person. Here's a big year, here's the story I'm going to tell about. I, my students and I will regularly sit down and we will discuss the figures for a paper before we write the paper, so often before we write the experiment. Here's what we, because with science, we should have a hypothesis. The hypothesis should lead us to something, right? We want to tell that story, but why do you think it's also good to think about the figures before I run the experiments? The other book is a try. So we shouldn't have a conclusion we're looking for, but I can know. I want a figure that analyzes this without knowing what the conclusion is. But if I'm going to collect data to generate a figure, wouldn't it be good to, to know what I wanted to collect before I run the experiment? So it's actually good to think about, here's what I want the experiment to show. I'm going to analyze it, right? In fact, in my view, a good experiment, we'll talk about much more later, right? A good experiment is an experiment for which it doesn't matter what the outcome is. I have a paper, if it does this, or if it doesn't do this. Either way, I have a story to tell. In fact, if you can design a paper so that, that it's a story, no matter if it's good or bad, you're almost guaranteed to have a paper, because it's good either way. So thinking about, but thinking about the figures in the story help us craft, here is what I want to measure. Because if I can't think about how I would display what it is I want to talk about, if I can't draw it, then maybe I'm going to have a hard time explaining it. If I think about doing this, oh, maybe if I measure this instead, I can do it. We have plenty of time, despite the fact that I shouldn't do this, right? I would say three quarters of the paper, we rerun experiments after we get data and we don't you know, we change where some of our hypotheses are going. We've had some of the papers where like the experiments were like the complete opposite of what we thought they were going to be, and we have to rerun new experiments and do so. so it's not like they always work out. But if you don't go into a paper thinking what the figure is going to be, you will have a harder time making sure you measure and collect the stuff and tell the story the way you want. So this idea of here's the drawing and the story I want to tell is a great way of thinking about how to present your research, and maybe even affecting how you're going to do your research. Because now you know here is the, the simple version of it. You can explain it that way and get you going. The other is from the writer's block point of view, if you're stuck in just throwing little kids' drawings and comic books and whatever, you'll often get you through the writer's block because you're not focusing on the words and now the story and the pictures and things, which are a lot easier to count. Are the, are the stories right or the figures right? Probably not. As I said, you'll throw 35% of them will be wrong, you'll throw them away, you start all over. But that's okay, you're making progress by doing something with them. So, um, when it comes to your assignment for next week, the sort of mind map, you can think of it as also related to this. You're trying to come up with a way of drawing, here's the research space here now. You are allowed to use box diagrams, but I will think it'll be better if you can do it with the So, um, we're out of time for today. I would like you to take a picture with your phone of your drawing and Upload it as part of your journal transcript. Um, just because this way I can get a little bit of feedback and see how things are going. Don't worry, my handwriting and my drawing are probably worse than any of your views. So don't worry that you're not an artist. I'm not either. That wasn't the point. Any questions? Okay, thanks. So, Jennifer, um, you did the class exercises in class, so there'll be somewhere in between. You'll have to do the things that I'll, that I'll write. But, um, and I will try and post the videos later anyhow. So, so the second time it seemed to work. Is that correct?
Okay, the audio cut off the last 45 seconds. Is everything going to be in writing on Canvas of what we need to do? Yes, all the, all the assignment stuff will be in writing. It's a separate assignment on Canvas. Okay, just okay. having a hard time keeping track of it all. Okay.